exciting cities in the tri-state area, it's late night with David Letterman. Tonight's guests are screenwriter Stephen Tessich, comedian Pat Paulson, dentist Norman Hoffman with a review of Warren Beatty's Reds, also a tour of NBC and a report on people you won't be seeing on the show, and Uncle Sam. And now, a man who stopped and smelled the roses for a year and a half, David Letterman! I distinctly heard a human making dog noises. <laughs> Good morning, welcome to Late Night. My name is David Letterman. And in all honesty, do you know anybody who dresses like this? <laughs> See, just moments ago, I was uh, fumfering around my dressing room uh, looking for pants to wear, and I came up with these, and uh, what do you, they look like balloons or something, don't they? I don't... Nonetheless, uh, good morning, and uh, it's cold outside in New York City, and I guess uh, cold in most other parts of the United States, but boy, uh, we got some fun for you here tonight. Uh, before we get to it, uh, I, I, had, I had something I wanted to tell you, I think. Have I covered everything? I just got here, didn't I? Oh, I know what I wanted to tell you. I watched the uh, Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago, and I uh, saw John Madden, and then I saw him again uh, over the weekend on Saturday Night Live. You see him on these beer commercials. And uh, the thought keeps running through my mind, how big would this guy be if he wasn't drinking light beer? You know, he's just... I'm glad you people are here, uh, not only to help me pick out a suitable wardrobe, but uh, a wonderfully talented screenwriter, uh, the gentleman who authored uh, Breaking Away and uh, Four Friends and Others, Steve Tesich, is joining us tonight. Uh, uh, a gentleman to review Warren Beatty's motion picture, Reds. Uh, this gentleman happens to be a dentist, Norman Hoffman. <laughs> Wherever Norman Hoffman goes, of course, the groupies are everywhere. And uh, uh, we're going to have a special tour of NBC and a couple of surprises. Pat Paulson is here tonight, and he. <laughs> He's going to do something unbelievable right here on this television program, never before seen uh, in North America. Now, uh, I've covered everything, right? Okay, now i tell you what we were going to do. Uh, we're going to go up here and visit with some of the folks in the studio audience. We like to call it a studio audience, uh, and so we do. How do you do? Were you making the dog noises? What is your name? Wendy. What do you do for a living, Wendy? I'm a student. You're a student. Good money in that. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. How do you do? What is your name, sir? Dick Eckelbarger. Dick Eckelbarger, stand up for a second. Do you mind, Dick? Where are you from? You look like you have a tan. Tucson, Arizona. And you are in New York City for the purpose of? Uh, business purposes. Uh, can you be a little more specific about that, uh, Dick? <laughs> uh, we're here selling some software products. And uh, software being? Uh, computer programs. Oh, yeah. Um, does that mean anything to anybody? <laughs> well, nice to have you here, Dick. How long have you been in New York? Uh, two days. And what have you done besides come here? We've been out to eat a few times. <laughs> kind of a dream come true for Dick, isn't it? Uh, I guess you don't get to eat much back there in Arizona, huh? Uh, sometimes we eat there. Well, I appreciate you coming here tonight. Nice to see you. Uh, do you mind, uh, is, are you related to this woman here, Dick? No, I'm not. You're not. Do you mind standing up, ma'am? What is your name? Sally Ponce. Sally, do you mind coming out here? Is this microphone working? Must be my mouth, then. <laughs> Where are you from, Sally? Tucson, Arizona. Do you, and you don't know Dick? I know Dick, but we're not together. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, they, no, they'll believe that back in Arizona. Um, have you ever been to a television studio before? Never. Uh, it's kind of impressive, uh, awe-inspiring, all of this uh, equipment and, of course, the nearly trained crew. <laughs> is, uh, is there a particular piece of uh, equipment out there that interests you? This one right here. This one, that's the producer. <laughs> what, what, do you, what, what were you pointing at? I was pointing at this machine. 
Oh, this one looking at us? That is a, that's a television camera. Uh, would you ever have any interest in running one of those? Sure. All right, uh, we're going to teach you how to run one of these tonight, and it may come in handy back there in Tucson, was it? Yes. And your name is? Sally. Sally. Okay, Sally, come on down here if you don't mind. Uh, uh, watch your purse, will you get... Sally, what do you think? Is it the slacks or is it the coat? I... The slacks and the sacks. The slacks and the what? The sacks. They're holding the slacks. <laughs> the slacks and the sacks. Oh, you... Socks. socks. Yes. Oh, I see. Well, that is what that is. I should take off this. I look like I rolled off a turnip truck. Uh, okay, Sally, uh, I'll tell you what let's do. This is, uh, uh, this is Pam. This is okay. Sally, and uh, Pam, how long have you been running the, the big machine here? Oh, about two years, Dan. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, what, what model is that? It's a TK-44. TK-44, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right, uh, Pam, just go ahead and tell uh, Sally what she needs to do here. Okay, why don't you just put this headset on, and you can hear the director that way. That will be Hal Gurney you're listening right. to there. Hi, Sally. Hi. Now... Are those going to fit? You okay? Yeah. Okay. Now... Hold on to it. Some of you other guys may okay. want to look in here. <laughs> this is your Zoom handle. Okay. This can... is the Zoom handle, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, you can make it go in. Uh-huh. Okay, and you can bring it back. Okay. And this is your focus handle. Put your hand up there, and that'll make it either soft uh -huh. or sharp. Okay. okay. You can pan all around, left to right. Mm -hmm. How much is this worth, Pam? Oh, probably about $100,000. $100,000. I'll be very careful. Okay. You can make it go way, way Whoa. up. That's okay. terrific. And you can make it go way, way down. Okay. Boy, you uh -huh. need some Dramamine for that. <laughs> and wherever these little red arrows are pointing is where the wheels are going to go. And the whole thing will go. Okay, okay we all, are we all okay. set, Hal? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Where do you want me? You get on the mark, on the little yellow T mark there. Right, oh, right here? Oh, okay. Stick to it. And don't fool around, please. Okay, I'll try not to. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go, David. That's perfect, Sally. <laughs> do what now? So uh, we're going over here, Sally. Okay. Right over there. That's good. Now move in. Put a truck in. Push in there. Yeah, that's good. Keep going. Keep going. Good. Let's see David. That's the end of the car. You do. Okay, focus up. Okay, now we have... Uh, Let's see some of the products. Okay, we have some sponges here. And by the way, everybody uh, on the show tonight gets one of these lovely and durable David Letterman sponges. Uh, we can't read it, David. There you go. Uh, Sal, oh. would you focus it up? Just focus little? in there a little bit. Oh, that's good. I'll okay, now that. put it in the water there. Can we get a shot of the water, Sally? There's something on the dust, Sally. Just push the head down like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you move in more, Sally? Just move in. Just push yeah. the camera right in there. It's all, it's all the way in, Hal. It's going to turn over and we'll be out of 100 grand. <laughs> okay, then just focus up. Good. Okay. Good. Well, you're doing very well, Sally. <laughs> this is Paul Schaefer, our musical director, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Okay, how about a nice close-up of Paul here? Zoom into Paul there, yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> hey, Paul, here's your big opportunity. <laughs> now, why not do two shots, Sally? Uh, that, that means yeah. the both of us? The two, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to push the camera in more. Very good. We'll settle for two of anything, Sally. Hey, right. I'm on stage now. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. You did very well. Down here? Okay. David, lead us into a commercial, please. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Sally. You've, you've done a fine job. Thank you. You're just, you're just wonderful. Thank you. We have to pause. We'll be right back with Pat Paulson. Very nice job, Sally. Good morning. My
my thanks to Sally Ponce from uh, Tucson, Arizona. You did a very nice job, Sally. I have removed my pants, for those of you who were worried about it earlier. Uh, television viewers haven't seen much of Pat Paulson since the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. It went off the air in 1975. Uh, after losing several bids for the presidency and after failing in a TV series of his own, Pat virtually dropped out of sight. Well, he's back now, and it's a pleasure to welcome him to our program tonight. Here's Pat Paulson. Nice to see you. You're looking all uh, fit and trim, as it were. Well, I'm really excited to be here on your uh, <laughs> second show. I could so, tell. Yeah. Uh, before we talk about what you may or may not have been doing lately, I want to talk about uh, a couple of projects in your earlier life. One was the, uh, uh, the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, and uh, some of the people who worked on that show, uh, like yourself, who went on to become uh, mainstays in the world of comedy and so forth. Who, el who else wrote or performed on that show? Well, some of the people that Tommy was responsible for their success, I would, uh, Kenny Rogers, Steve Martin, mm -hmm. writers, uh, people who want to produce things like um, Alan Bly uh, and um, Bob Einstein went on to produce uh, Sonny and Cher. Uh, Jerry Music went on to produce uh, Bob Newhart Show. Many of those people were discovered by Tom, so he deserves a lot of credit. Yeah. There were others too, Jennifer Singer. Uh -huh. And, uh, At the time when you were working with Steve Martin, did you have any, any indication that he was going to become uh, uh, more than uh, sort of part-time work, you know? Well, I knew that Steve was writing uh, one for Steve, one for Pat, <laughs> and saving the good stuff yeah, yeah. for later. <laughs> I've had that happen here. Uh, uh, I bet. Yeah. So uh, it was pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> now... Uh, uh, so tell us now what you have been doing in the introduction we mentioned that you uh, have sort of uh, well, other of things I, I guess huh? well I went on after that into the college uh, circuit did a lot of uh, well the 60s and I noticed they've changed quite a bit mm -hmm. I've been away but they've changed in the 60s they were out uh, protesting against their parents mm -hmm. in the 70s they were out protesting against their parents and making free love and today uh, they're out protesting against their parents making free love mm -hmm. Just an ugly set of circumstances, isn't Some it? full circle. Yeah. Now, uh, what, I understand you have something that you would like to do for us this evening. Are you well, want, when you I want to talk about that now or talk about that uh, in a minute? How about tomorrow? Oh, okay, yeah. we're going to uh, pause here and oh, then come back and talk about it? Okay, we'll do that. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the program. Steve Pesich will be here, and uh, Pat Paulson is with us now. Uh, anyway, before the commercial, you mentioned that uh, you are going to do something here tonight. Well, you know, what happened after that show was I got into kind of a depressing state. <laughs> I wasn't doing too well, yeah. okay, and I started drinking a little. I got into drugs pretty heavy. Uh -huh. And then I uh, started uh, reading about Indian philosophy. I got into that pretty much. I went to India, went to a little town called Butek which is on the Tibetan border near, near India, and I... Uh, Butek? Uh-huh, B-U-T-E-K. Mm -hmm. And I studied Indian philosophy there, uh, trying to more or less bring myself back to uh, what I was before. It's very, uh, <laughs> it's a very hard regimen at first. There's many things you have to do in order to get to a certain point. Basically, there's chakra, which is seven planes. It starts from the top of the head and mm -hmm. uh, goes to the pelvic area. Mm -hmm. That's basically where these energy lines are. They're concentric. So I learned... Uh, we have these with us at all times? Yeah, you do. And yeah. if you, it's like you're sleeping north, south, east, west. Mm -hmm. All of these... Uh, it depends on where your energy vortex is. Mine, uh, apparently, is very strong because I got to the point where I could, uh, I could levitate. So I've, I've, never done that. I've never done that in public, but I can By I levitating, can you mean actually without visible means of support yeah. off the ground? That's right. Your body? Uh-huh. Yeah. You, you've done that? I have done it. Mm -hmm. uh, about, I would say about 87 times so far. <laughs> well, that's the kind of thing you do want to count, I guess. Well, I know uh, every time I do it, it takes a lot out of you, so I know yeah. at the time when I do yeah. it. It's like anything else. But it is just mind over matter, right? That's all it is. Yeah. 
And you are uh, going to do that for us this evening? I'm going to do it. I know I'll do it. Okay. You have to have, you know, have to have faith. I can't have people laughing or anything while I'm doing this. No. Well, that hasn't been a problem so far. Um, <laughs> now, now, if this, if you're absolutely serious about this, what can we do for you to help here? I know you, you have some. Well, they've set here. it up back here. Do we go I'm back over there? All right. Okay. Going to levitate. This will be 88. Is that right, Pat? Uh, yeah, I think. Well, 88. Yeah, maybe. I, maybe it was 80. Well, this might be 89. I'm not sure. About 88 that. or 89. Okay. Where do Where do you want me to stand? Right here. Don't get too close to me because the vibrations are not that good. Okay. Do you need anything? This is a a tank full of I'm guessing. Oh, this is going to be water. Yeah, unless it's uh, Vaseline. It looks like water to me. <laughs> And you're going to actually levitate above the water. I'm going to try. Would you rather I stopped interrupting? Uh, yeah, I just need a second here. Okay. Be a good time to get a beer. Okay, I think I'm ready. The uh, water's too da darn low here. Oh, the water? Yeah, I have to step right on. I don't know. Well, let me try it again. I, mean, I don't like try it again. <laughs> okay, here we go. Do you need anything? No. No, I'm okay. Okay, I'll do it again. Okay, here we go. <laughs> no, don't. Uh, Water's hostile or something. Yeah. 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 Oh, we have this. Uh, we have this attempt. So this would be the attempt at number eighty-eight or eighty-nine uh, or eighty-nine ninety. Is this uh, tap water here? I don't know where we got the water. Well, take a look now. We have this through the miracle of slow motion. Yeah, this water is not like the water I usually use. Are you Are you going to be all right? No, I'm okay. I just okay, wanna... I tell you, so now you want to you wanna, you come on down and... Uh, no, I want to just sit here and, and think about it. Okay, Pat, <laughs> you, Pat's going to sit here and think about it. Uh, we're going to pause. Uh, we'll be right back. Hi there, and welcome back to the show. And uh, coming up later in this uh, program, we'll have a visit with uh, Stephen Tesich and uh, also uh, uh, some folks uh, scheduled for the show, but for one reason or another, uh, they were unable to make the final cut, and I know you'll be looking forward to that. And uh, we also hope to have a, a movie review of the motion picture Reds uh, from our resident movie reviewer, dentist, Dr. Norman Hoffman. Uh, and we have to pause now for station identification. With Thank you very much. Welcome back to the program. My name is David Letterman. In this half hour, uh, author Stephen Tesich will be joining us, and uh, we're going to have a, a film review of the motion picture Reds with uh, uh, Norman Hoffman, the dentist. You know, uh, a lot of folks uh, wanted to be on this television program, but for one reason or another, uh, we could not accommodate them. Nonetheless, we keep their resumes and photos on file. Here now, in a rare behind-the-scenes glimpse into show business, we'd like to show you some of the folks who will not be seen on this television program. First of all, Earl Hofert from Linton, Indiana, wanted to be on our show. Mr. Hofert has devoted his life to annoying theater goers. <laughs> Here we see Earl during a recent performance of Evita asking a complete stranger to join him in singing Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. <laughs> you won't be seeing Earl on this show. I just got tired of being ripped off. That's what Wendell P. Robinson told us when he phoned and asked if he could be on the program. I'll bet I lost over $20 in them damn Pepsi machines. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I went out and built my own. You won't be seeing either Wendell on the right or his vending machine on this show. This is pretty exciting, this next guy. 
well-known audiologist Clifford Williamson, who is from Portland, Oregon, wanted to be on our show <laughs> to demonstrate a new technique he has developed to be used when you're having trouble hearing someone. <laughs> Williamson, shown here demonstrating the method, told us, are you kidding? It's going to be bigger than the Heimlich maneuver. <laughs> Steve Elliott Kipner from Shaker Heights, Ohio, wanted to be on the program. According to Mr. Kipner, he'd like to come on and as shown in this photograph, oh, this is good, answer questions from small groups of businessmen about how he gets his hair to look just like Dick Clark's. <laughs> you won't be seeing Steve on the show. Uh, it's interesting, everyone here today has a middle name. Ed Pops Seamler wanted to be on our show to demonstrate what he does for a living. I explain things to people who don't know a lot, said Ed. <laughs> Ed is shown here explaining what a light bulb is to a man who had been asleep since birth. <laughs> Former President of the United States. Yes, the, uh, the near and the great, or the near great, or the ingrates. Uh, former President of the United States, Jimmy Carter, wanted to be on our show to demonstrate his favorite pastime since leaving office. Says, Jimmy, I guess I'm just like any other American. I enjoy cruising singles bars. <laughs> We think it will replace the bus. That's what Kurt Ladder, Ladmer Newman told us when asked if he could be on our show to demonstrate his solution to the problem of energy-saving mass transportation. The only drawback, according to Kurt, is we don't like to stop for old folks. They just can't keep up. Well, you won't be seeing Kurt on the television program. Coming up in a minute or two, Stephen Tesich will join us, folks. Thank you, folks. Welcome back to the show. Steve Tesich uh, has written such movies as, uh, of course, Breaking Away, and uh, recently completed the screenplay for Garp, uh, and uh, Eyewitness, and his current motion picture, Four Friends, is uh, quite popular all across the United States. Originally from Yugoslavia, uh, he's here with us tonight, and he spent uh, part of his life, as you probably know, in Indiana. Please now a nice welcome for Steve Tesich. I mentioned, that, uh, uh, as people now know, that you lived for a time in Indiana. Maybe they don't know that. I knew that because uh, I lived there, I guess, around two, the same time you were there. Two Hoosiers. Yeah. But that was, of course, the, uh, the setting for Breaking Away. That was my college years, and uh, I ran into a guy uh, who was doing his Italian fantasy. Uh, I was riding a bike. I hear an Italian opera being sung behind me. I turn around, there's this guy climbing a hill singing starts talking Italian to me, and being Yugoslavian, knowing how tough it is on foreigners, I really have pity on the guy. Mm -hmm. For a week, I try to tell him what America is like, what it's like to be in Indiana, and all this. And then I find out he was born in Indianapolis, grew up there, <laughs> and this whole fantasy thing, it was just a kind of a daydream. So this, uh, not to take any of the credit away from you, but this thing sort of wrote itself, huh? Well, uh, the, the central character did. Then, then, then uh, he sort of got me so hooked on bicycle racing, I gave up my wrestling scholarship. I, I joined that bicycle team. I, whoever saw uh, Breaking Away, the little 500. <laughs> Uh, and uh, my f freshman year, we won that race, which yeah. was a uh, really wonderful kind of entry into campus life. Was this the, uh, the first movie that you had written? It was the first movie, it was the first screenplay that I had written, and it took uh, eight years for people to see fit to make it. No kidding. So yeah. and, uh, how, do you, how does one keep from getting uh, miserably discouraged when you've written something, you've got it neatly typed, I would guess, and it lays around for eight years? Uh, <laughs> well, you, you, you really keep writing other things. Because uh, if you're going to wait for that one thing to be made, and uh, the, actually I was positive nobody was going to make it because everybody had read it. It was like a library book. Mm -hmm. I would meet people, say, that's a great screenplay. Why yeah. don't you write this other thing for us? Uh -huh. And you kept wondering if it's so great, why don't they make it? You know, but they, somehow nobody 
could see a film in it. Is that difficult? Uh, now, now this the breaking away was so personal, or so you were so personally involved in it. It was probably easier to write than someone saying to you, "I got a great idea." Yeah, there's a couple of guys got... are going to Neptune. <laughs> uh -huh. um, you know, if they say, "Write this idea," is that harder than writing your own idea? Uh, I, I would not know what couple of guys going to Neptune talk about on their way mm -hmm. up there. Yeah. Now, if they said, "Couple of guys from East Chicago." Uh, going to Neptune. I said, okay, I know two guys. You know, there's Joe Kish, I know. I know what he'd say on his way to Neptune. I could do that. <laughs> well, let's get some of this stuff down, Steve. I think we... I think. Um, now, Garp was, of course, not written by you. Was that difficult to adapt uh, somebody else's novel to a screenplay? Uh, it, it, I, I would love to say how hard it was, because, you know, people want to hear that, and I, 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 then I come off sounding really good. But it yeah. was easy. Hmm. It's a terrible thing to admit. It was just wonderfully easy to write it. Is I saw how to do it, and I was so excited. I sat down, next thing I knew it was finished. Did you have uh, lengthy discussions uh, with the author of that or the people producing the movie? Uh, I would not call him lengthy. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like stealing, isn't it? Uh, actually, we didn't have a discussion. Uh, <laughs> they, they do know you did it, though, huh? Uh, <laughs> when I finished the screenplay, I sent it to John Irving, but uh -huh. uh, I, I really couldn't... Um, see having a discussion with anybody until I finished writing it. Uh -huh. There was nothing to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> this is, never having done this, oh, this is mystifying to me, but I'll take your word for it. Um, the other thing that I was interested in about uh, East Chicago, Indiana, what is that like? I never actually was in East Chicago, Indiana. Well, there, there, was, a, there was a picture that you had uh, of the people that didn't make it on the show, and there was, uh, there was a guy with one of those Pepsi machines. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if, if you took all those pipes uh, and you kind of multiply them a million times and you put this constantly red sky above it. There, you have East Chicago, except, yeah. except within it you have wonderful people. Yeah. Uh, and then that's really uh, how I remember it. I can remember, uh, we talked about this earlier in the late 60s, it, before they did anything really to curb the, the pollution, this is a heavy uh, industry town, a lot of steel, and uh, iron smelting or whatever they do with iron or whatever Refineries. they do with smelt for that matter. <laughs> um, and the air, like you said, was continually orange. It was beautiful. You, uh, twice a day it would be right. It would either be sunset or sunrise and it would be yeah, perfect. But, 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 uh, but the nice thing, it was no, uh, they hadn't invented pollution then, so we didn't know it was polluted. Mm -hmm. You know, we just, it, it's nice and red. And people actually felt that... Uh, <laughs> well, they really thought, uh, the immigrants, the Serbians, uh, I, I of course joined the Serbian community, and they said, that stuff really makes you tough. Mm -hmm. This air, you breathe this air, you get really strong. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, you come to a new country and you assume people right. know what they're talking about. So I breathe deeply. But uh, hardly ever do you go to your doctor and he says, you're not breathing enough soot. <laughs> you don't hear that. Uh, so anyway, you, you came from Yugoslavia. Well, and someone has Chicago. to. You know? <laughs> uh, I can't imagine in my present circumstance uh, uh, just picking up and moving to a foreign country. You did it uh, with your family. Uh, what was that like? Well, it, it, was, it, was, it was very strange because you formed, uh, I formed notions of America uh, in Yugoslavia by watching films, and uh, most of the films were westerns. And so therefore when I landed, uh, I honestly expected, maybe if not John Wayne, a close friend of his to be there on a horse uh, <laughs> waiting for me to take me to the guy, and we're going to ride off uh, across these prairies that mm -hmm. I didn't seem to see when I landed at Ellis Island. All right. And, 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 and the language, my first contact with English, because I was so eager to pick up new words, was shuboom shupum. <laughs> and and uh, I said, well, uh, it's English. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I started looking around and asking around, and that was the first sound I heard the song was playing mm -hmm. on Ellis Island, shuboom shupum. And, and that was somehow a bit of a shock. It, of course, means don't breathe. The <laughs> uh, we're going to we're going to take a look at uh, a small portion of, of four friends. I, is this what we're going to do now? Okay. This is the uh, the newest film uh, presently in release that uh, Stephen Tesich has authored, autobiographically. Oh, very. Do you need to tell anything about this? Uh, there, there's the, the central hero in this piece is coming home. Uh, the girl he loves is getting married, and he thinks he knows to whom. <laughs> okay, so the girl. Here we go. Thought you'd come to kiss her salt. Whoa. Now, Louie, well, I'd like you to meet my good buddy Louie Carnegie, Georgia, Tom. 
Uh, hi. David? Hello, Dave. Hello, Rudy. Rudy. Thanks for coming. Yes, I've heard about all of you. I hope that you and Tom will be very happy. I hope so, too. <laughs> <laughs> what about David and me? Yes, of, of course. It's just that the custom calls for the bride and groom. I think I better shut up. David! Well, she asked me and... Uh... I'm going to have a baby. Well, congratulations. It's Tom's baby. <laughs> what the hell's going on? I didn't want to get married. I did. I love ceremonies. I can't wait to have my baby. Isadora Duncan had babies and it made her dance that much better. It did. It made her flower. What about That's me? what I'm going to do. I'm going to flower. Why? Why didn't you tell me? You had your chance. Uh, it, um, it, mostly autobiographical. Uh, very much so. Now, which one would have been you in there? The guy that had his chance and blew it. Yeah. Because uh, in the movie, the girl, when she decides it is time for her to more or less give up her virginity, she comes to this guy. And that, says, that being you? Uh, unfortunately. Yeah. And unfortunately, it was the 60s where you say, my God, I love you. You do not do that with someone you love. And, uh, you know, it takes the character in a film only about eight years to make up for that. Now, this, 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 was, uh, this was your observation of the 60s. Uh, perhaps not yours, I take it, by the look you're giving. Well, I don't, I don't know. It's just, I, You've I had have, other experiences. Uh, I've had very little experience in the 70s, and so far the 80s ain't been good. Um, but, uh, but seriously, that's the way... Uh, that certainly was the way I... It's, it's, it's that word respect, you know. I kept thinking, you know, they're testing me. And, and if I say, okay, they're going to lose respect for me. That word respect ruined more things and, and how you were going to lose respect for someone if you make love to them. And I firmly believe that. Yeah, I was uh, under the impression that the 60s was the first decade when all of that sort of... It started changing, it, yeah. it, but uh, the film uh, starts in 61, uh, and that's sort of uh, the period that I went through in East Chicago. Yeah. You're not, you're not living in East Chicago now, eh? No, uh, I, have a, I have a cabin in Colorado. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I spend most of the time. Which of, uh, between the two of these uh, four friends and breaking away, which would be uh, uh, the, the work of your heart, so to speak? Uh, the work of my heart is always the last thing, uh, because uh, it's always the next thing, and the next thing is not written. So <laughs> the, whatever I write next, I, I can't pick favorites. Yeah. And uh, you're pretty excited about Garp? It is a wonderful film. Yeah. I've seen it eight times, and George Roy Hill, uh, <laughs> I have, and, uh, because I kept, I kept waiting for it not, not to be as good as the last time. Yeah. And it's just a gorgeous film. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stephen Pickett. Uh, we'll be right back with a tour of NBC. Uh, yesterday, as you may recall, if you were with us, uh, we gave you a tour of... <laughs> yesterday, as you may recall, we gave you a tour of the set here, uh, our brand new set in Studio 6A at NBC in the RCA building. Now that your appetite for touring has been whetted, it's time to take a look at the building that is NBC. Hi. I thought tonight would be a fine time to show each and every one of you around the RCA building here in Manhattan, home of the world's finest broadcast facility, NBC. But since I really can't show each and every one of you around, I've invited along a young broadcaster of tomorrow. Hi, what's your name? My name is Stanley Floorman. Fine, Stanley. I hope you enjoy the tour. And also, I've asked this gentleman right here to go with us since he 
just happens to have a television <laughs> camera with him. Now, Stanley, uh, broadcasting is a very complex and serious business, and it takes years and years to understand it fully. So if you have any questions, don't be embarrassed to speak right up, okay? Is this live or on tape? I'm not sure about that, Stanley. Huh? How about lunch? There'll be lunch. Don't you worry. <laughs> this is one of my favorite places in the building, Stanley. TV network operations, facilities, and maintenance. And here's a fine example of the work they're doing. <laughs> Impressed so far? And how? Well, hold on to your hat. We're headed for the sixth floor. Oh, boy. I bet you've never seen one of these before, Stanley. This is an elevator. It's used to transport NBC employees from floor to floor. Is that right? You bet. Let's take a ride. <laughs> Department of Sex and Violence. Boy, I'd like to see that. No, not on this show, Stanley. Not right now. Maybe later when we get closer to the ratings. This is the David Letterman Research Department. Every piece of activity going on inside this room is devoted to finding out what exactly works best on our show. Why does all the clocks have different times? Well, Stanley, we need to know exactly what time it is all over the world in case we want to, well, say, place a prank phone call to Buenos Aires to order a bunch of pizzas, send them to somebody's house. <laughs> we need to know what time is the funniest. Yes, even the silly behavior on our program is the result of hours and hours of precise planning. No kidding. You know, Stanley, NBC does a lot more than just broadcast your favorite television programs into your home. They spend a lot of time developing products for tomorrow, like this new appliance here, the electric closet. That's right, Stanley, one day all our closets will be powered by electricity. Ooh, don't touch it, Stanley, it's very hot. Wow. NBC Television Network Affiliate Relations. A lot more interesting than it sounds, Stanley, because a television network without affiliates is like an ocean without fish. Without fish? That's right, Stanley. The swordfish, the trout, the catfish, the bass, the eel, the manta ray, the red snapper, even the sea bass would all be lost without affiliates. What about the tuna? Even the tuna, Stanley. How about the lobster? No, the lobster is a crustacean. It would be okay. How about guppies? Uh, yeah, there's no guppies on here, but they'd be lost. How about fish sticks? <laughs> yeah, well, that's enough, Stan. How about goldfish? How about turbot? How about place? We're on our way to the announcing office now, Stanley. All of the announcing you hear on NBC, show introductions, station identifications, uh, even lists of prizes you hear on game shows, come right out of the announcing office here. And this is the woman who does all of the announcing for NBC. Hello, Lillian. Hi, how are you? Hi, nice to see you. Good to see you again. Amazing. with uh, Dennis Norman Hoffman with a review of the motion picture, Red. Hotel accommodations for most guests of Late Night with David Letterman furnished by Berkshire Place, a Dunphy Classic Hotel, in exchange for this announcement. For reservations at Dunphy Hotels in the U.S. and Europe, call toll-free 800-228-2121. I'm proud this evening to introduce a new feature on our show that we are calling Limited Perspective. In it, we are featuring discussions of popular media events from particular points of view. Tonight, I'd like you to meet a dentist from here in New York City, Dr. Norman Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman has been practicing dentistry since 1946. We asked Dr. Hoffman to attend Warren Beatty's new movie, Reds, and let us know how it looked from the dentist point of view. Dr. Hoffman. In the making of the motion picture, Reds, the producers have gone to a great expense to create the illusion of authenticity with respect to architectural details, style of dress, means of transportation, and so on. But one cannot help but notice a notable failure in the attempt to produce realism in the movie. The story takes place at the beginning of the century when dental methods were relatively crude. 
Yet the stars of the film, Warren Beatty, Diane Keaton, Jack Nicholson, and so on, are seen displaying near-perfect dentition <laughs> with respect to color and shape and occlusion and gingival health and general aesthetics. And this would have required the use of acrylic veneered gold, porcelain fused to gold, porcelain alone, implants, and a host of other methods that were historically not available at that time. Okay, Dr. Hoffman, uh, how is Jack Nicholson in the film? Well, in this picture, he doesn't show any teeth, but uh, in, the, in the picture, from a subjective point of view, uh, just a, uh, an impression, he, uh, his teeth were much too even. They uh, looked like a picket fence. Mm -hmm. No undulations to them. Undulations Nothing are natural. I right. think they should have lengthened some of them to give them more naturalness. How about Diane Keaton? Diane Keaton has a high lip line, <laughs> and she's showing a lot of teeth in gingiva. Her two front central teeth are slightly elongated. That pretty much ruined the film for you? Uh, of course, here is the uh, writer, producer, director, star, Warren Beatty. Warren Beatty uh, appeared slightly toothy, but better than the others, better than uh, Diane Keaton's or uh, Nicholson's. Mm -hmm. I would say that Warren Beatty's teeth were the best of all of the uh, stars of the show. Okay. So now, uh, what have we got here? Well, here we have a long shot of a crowd. <laughs> but uh, fortunately for the film, there were many close-ups of this crowd, and their teeth showed to better advantage. But here again, there was a great lack of credibility, because uh, in those days, back in 1915, many of the teeth were covered with gold and silver, and yet the teeth of the crowds in those movies were not different from maybe the teeth of the audience in front of us now. So, generally speaking, then, the film was uneven. The teeth was uneven, and the uh, tooth didn't fit the parts. Fine. <laughs> Dr. Hoffman, thank you very much. <laughs> you enjoyed your review. Uh, I want to thank uh, the studio audience, you folks are wonderful, I appreciate you being here, and uh, also Stephen Tesich, Dr. Hoffman, and uh, Pat Paulson attempting to levitate above water. Uh, tomorrow night on our program, uh, Terry Gilliam will be here, Hank Aaron, newly elected to the Hall of Fame, a report on new products of 1982, and a special, a special report on celebrities and their business machines, plus Irving Cesar. Caesar. Good night. Ever since the dawn of time, man has been fascinated by the unique, the different, the unusual. In his never-ending search to become master of his universe, man has explored every corner of the world, from the offbeat, the curious, the bizarre. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Ralph Story, and tonight the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour is proud to bring you the results of over a year of painstaking research. Our crews and cameras have journeyed to the four corners of the earth in order to provide our viewers with a rare glimpse of those curious and unusual events that alter and illuminate our times. And would you believe that Mr. Patrick L. Pulse claims to be the only living human being who can walk on water? I'd like to explain a little about this before I get into it. Uh, I spent some 15 years in Burma as a yogi studying there at one of the hermitages, edges, and uh, I learned how to do this, levitate. I have pictures of me doing it. It's not something I can do easily. It requires help from the audience, from musicians who are generally skeptical a lot, from, uh, <laughs> and I can tell by the looks on their faces.
So it'll be quite amazing to you to see this done. Uh, I have to have complete silence while I do it. And to show you that it's not a fake or anything, somebody actually stuck a ladder in here, and there's a skeptic right there. Uh, I don't need the ladder. Uh, I don't know how long I'll be able to stay up there, but I will require your help as I do it. So I'll just move over here. Now, to uh, get the idea of any fake uh, that you might think it is, I'd like to uh, drop this stone in. So it's real water. Now I have to have a period of meditation. So can we have a little quiet? This is strictly a matter of uh, mind over matter, and that's sort of the... Uh, if I hear noises, uh, the temple of my body sometimes forgets and is unable to do it. So you'll have to be rather quiet. talking or something. <laughs> I swear I saw a piranha in there, too. Eh? <laughs> I'm going to try it once more. Eh? Can we have complete silence again, please? You break my... Uh, Quiet, of thought. Here we go. Oh, 